As we saw in the very first episode, the Greeks made great advances on the road to science. Brilliant philosophers like Aristotle speculated about the universe. He devised a model in which the Earth was at the centre. Sun, moon and planets circled around the Earth on moving crystal spheres and the stars were on an outer enclosing sphere called the Stellatum. It was fairly obvious why this model was taken as plausible. Everybody who ever lived has felt the Earth to be stationary and has seen the heavenly bodies moving around it. But the great philosopher Plato declared that the sun was the embodiment of everything good and noble in the universe. Pythagoras declared that the sun was the most magnificent of the gods and ought to be at the centre. One of his disciples, Aristarchus of Samos, took Pythagoras literally. He came up with a model in which the sun was the centre of the universe. That idea was tossed around for a while and discarded as untenable. But a few thousand years later, the Roman Catholic Church became obsessed with the art and philosophy of pagan Greece and Rome. A Catholic priest called Nicholas Copernicus was particularly intrigued by Plato and Pythagoras. Through them, he came across Aristarchus and his sun-centred model of the universe. He was so impressed, he wrote a book about it. On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies. It was published in time for him to receive a copy just before he died. It was not well written, and only half of the print run was sold. The majority in the Catholic Church were favourable to Aristotle's crystal spheres. Many accepted his model, apparently on the grounds that it agreed with the Bible in putting the earth at the centre of the creation. When they heard of Copernicus's theory, they were not very impressed. Most, like Martin Luther, considered it to be an attack on the scriptures. But then a brilliant scientist called Galileo Galilei came on the scene. Galileo realised that Aristotle's physics was not true, even though it was taught in all the universities. He opposed Aristotle passionately. Galileo was a brilliant debater, and he made many enemies by making them look foolish. Galileo heard about Copernicus's sun-centred universe and realised it contradicted Aristotle. He immediately became an avid supporter. The Catholic Church was full of priests who were very interested in natural philosophy, as science was then called. They asked Galileo to prepare a thesis explaining the pros and cons of heliocentricity's sun-centred universe and geocentricity's earth-centred universe. But as we saw in episode 42, one of the greatest observational astronomers of all time, Tycho Brahe, claimed that his observations showed the Earth to be at the centre of the universe. The sun and moon go round the Earth and everything else goes round the sun. Galileo couldn't disprove this model. As far as I know, nobody has ever disproved it. So Galileo didn't write the thesis he'd agreed to write. He wrote a little book for the general public called Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, in which he had a very bright chap called Salviati, obviously representing himself, arguing for the sun-centred universe, and a fool called Simplicio arguing for the earth-centred universe. Galileo was not very wise about this. He put words well known to have been spoken by the Pope in the mouth of foolish Simplicio. The church was not amused. Galileo was severely censured and put under house arrest. That was, perhaps, not such a bad thing, because he spent his time at home 
performing well-thought-out experiments. He worked so carefully and accurately that Newton was able to use his results, as well as those of Brahe and Kepler, as a basis for his famous laws of motion. But the so-called Age of Enlightenment brought secularism and atheism to the fore. So Galileo became a hero who'd taken a stand against religious bigotry and was persecuted as reporting the truth. The sun-centred universe was almost universally accepted by the enlightened natural philosophers. It became an established fact of science. The sun was the centre of the universe. The earth orbited the sun and the earth turned about its axis each day. However, there was a problem. As we saw in episode 42, every attempt to measure the motion of the earth gave the result that the earth was not moving. But in 1851, a very bright Frenchman called Leon Foucault thought of a way to prove that the earth rotates once every day. This would prove that the Copernican system was correct, even though nobody could show that the Earth actually orbits the Sun. This, of course, is a logical fallacy. It would prove no such thing. Foucault made a pendulum, which was hailed as such a success that Foucault pendulums have been erected all over the world. They were considered proof, the only proof, for the Copernican system, and hence the only proof that the Bible is wrong about the Earth being the centre of the universe. The atheistic communist regime in Russia installed the biggest, and perhaps the most famous, in the magnificent cathedral of St. Isaac in St. Petersburg. This was just what the communists needed to display their contempt for the Bible. It was a great triumph for their atheistic regime. But what is this wonderful invention? How does it work? And how does it prove that the Earth rotates as Copernicus and Galileo claimed? An American engineer called R. G. Elmendorf wrote a little book in 1994. It does a pretty good job of answering those questions. It's well worth reading. In principle, the Foucault pendulum is just a weight, usually called a bob, hanging from a support by a thin wire. When it's set swinging, it gradually processes. The plane of swinging slowly moves in a circle. This is supposed to show that the Earth is turning. The claim is that the pendulum stays swinging in the same plane while the Earth turns beneath it. A simple but not very convincing mathematical analysis predicts the angle through which it should recess each hour. All very simple, but surprisingly difficult to get working as it is supposed to. R. S. McKay noted in the American Journal of Physics if care is not taken, a Foucault pendulum can appear to turn at the wrong rate or even indicate that the Earth is turning backward. Leon Foucault found these very problems when he set up his famous prototype in the Pantheon. And surprise, surprise, this was also once a cathedral, a cathedral commandeered by the godless French revolutionaries. Another ideal place to show a scientific disproof of the Bible. It took Foucault much longer than expected to open up the Pantheon for the display of his marvellous apparatus. It took time to discover that it had to be started in a certain direction. Otherwise, it would process the wrong way, indicating the Earth was turning backwards or it could process too quickly or too slowly to fit the theory. Foucault and his team also had to dock to the support for the wire and introduce a damping mechanism 
by making the pendulum swing through a ridge of sand to reduce ellipsing. Ellipsing is a common feature of Foucault's pendulums. The bob traces out an ellipse, not a straight line. The ellipse causes the swing to process in the direction of the eccentricity. The pendulum can precess clockwise or anticlockwise. The rate of precession depends on the width of the ellipse, which tends to increase with time. This was noticed very early in the history of Foucault pendulums. In November 1851, just a few months after Foucault's display opened in the Pantheon, A. Girard wrote, Every experimenter is struck by a tendency of the pendulum to get into an elliptical orbit and is disposed to ascribe the ellipticity to the imperfections of the apparatus, the resistance of the air, or some cause accidental and not essential to the experiment. But, as a greater or lesser amount of ellipticity sooner or later makes its appearance in every instant, it would appear reasonable to infer that it must proceed from some cause inseparable from the conditions of the motion. If the experiment had been set up to study the behaviour of a free-swinging pendulum, there would have been a real attempt to discover what was actually happening. But it had not been set up to discover any such thing. It had been set up to prove that the Bible was wrong. So nobody was interested in finding out how a pendulum really behaved. They were only interested in making it behave as it was supposed to behave to provide the required proof. The early pendulums, like Foucault's, used a conical hole below the support to limit the ellipsing. The ridge of sand also helped. It had a greater effect in limiting the sideways movement of the pendulum than slowing the movement of the direction of the swing. But it was soon discovered that if a ring of just the right size and shape was installed just below the support, it could restrict ellipsing much more effectively. Almost all pendulums after this discovery were provided with such a ring, which is called a Sharon ring. But although the Sharon ring made pendulums work much more like they were supposed to, they could not make the pendulum process at the right speed to fit the desired formula. They speeded up and slowed down and didn't even process at the same rate from day to day. So electromagnetic drive mechanisms were invented. They're now fitted to almost all Foucault pendulums. They usually involve either a ring electromagnet, acting on an iron sleeve on the upper part of the wire, or on electromagnets in the floor, below the pendulum wob, or both. Pulses to the electromagnets are timed to make the pendulum process just as the theory would have them process. An article in The Physics Teacher of September 1981 described the construction of a Foucault pendulum suitable for display in a school. It contains the remarkable statement, the complete pendulum can be seen inside the enclosure. But the wire suspension device and the electromagnetic drive mechanism are intentionally hidden from the observer. Could anyone make it more clear that these pendulums are not there to indicate the truth about anything? They're there to support a narrative. The Copernican story that the sun, not the earth, is the centre of the universe the narrative that the Bible has been proved wrong. But even if those pendulums worked as they were supposed to, they would still not prove what the constructors wanted to prove. For a start, 
astronomers have now decreed that neither the Earth nor the Sun is the centre of the universe. For close to half a century, they've been saying Copernicus said the Sun was at the centre of the solar system. This is a smokescreen to hide the ignorance of their hero. Copernicus had never heard of the solar system. It's a construct which relies on a theory of gravity. It's a recent invention which didn't exist at the time of the original protagonists. They were all talking about the centre of the universe. In the 20th century, astronomy changed drastically when Harlow Shapley popularised the idea of a vast universe full of millions of galaxies. And according to Carl Sagan, the Earth became a small blue dot lost in the vastness of space. The solar system started to circle round a galaxy, which circles round a local cluster of galaxies, which circles round a local supercluster. And so the story goes on, with each new circling involving speeds orders of magnitude faster than the previous one. The universe now officially has its centre everywhere and its edge nowhere, whatever that is supposed to mean. And whether we believe this dizzying, mind-boggling story or not, well-respected scientists like Fred Hoyle pointed out we know that the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motions only, and that such a difference has no physical significance. Mechanical observations can only prove relative motions, not absolute motions. To determine what is actually stationary and what is actually moving, one would need to stand outside the universe and look in, from a point known to be at rest. We can't do that. But we can accept what the one who can do so has told us. And if we accept what he tells us, we won't waste our time working to force Foucault pendulums to do what the scoffers say they ought to do. Jesus said that the work of God is that you believe on him who he hath sent, the one who can stand outside the universe and look in. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.